Hey, hello. We left off right here where we had finished the arch up, but we hadn't yet turned it into something that was useful. So let's go ahead and make this arch a little bit more interesting. So to do that, we have a lot of options, and the basic thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to do the exact same thing we did with these guys in terms of displacing bricks and making them uh, have a physical shape and a physical form. But this is complicated a little bit because our bricks are going to be partially buried in the sand. So if we leave it like this, what will happen is some of these bricks will fall away and others will fly off into the sunset, which is never very good. So in the end, we do have to take some unusual tasks. We have to do some unusual things. What we're going to do is we're going to move this up, uh, put it at some specific point like 0, 1, 10, 0. And then we're going to just grab one of these flat bricks here. These have a physics presence and can be landed on. And we'll just put this at the same place, 0, 1, 10, 0. And you can see that that makes it so that our, our object is resting on it. We're just going to move it down a little bit. And you know how we have to always be like, oh, how much do I move it down? Well, instead of worrying about precisely how much we're going to move it down by, just hit V, V, not B, and then grab it and then line it up like this. And when you have the Y position in the right spot, set the others back to zero. There we go. And so now, the uh, these will not fall onto uneven ground, and we'll move them into the uneven ground when we're done. So with that said, let's go ahead and add the things we need to add. We need a mesh collider, and we need a rigid body. So here you can see that our uh, object just kind of settles into itself. There's no particular difficulties. So to make it more difficult, oh, that is the image we were using. Let's remove one of the bricks, and we will go ahead and just see how this plays out. It doesn't play out at all. What's up? What's going on? Um, as you can see, maybe you can't see, we didn't actually add the rigid bodies. I don't know. I thought I added them. Let's try that again, shall we? Add a rigid body. Yeah, okay, now we'll try it. And they exploded. So let's go ahead and take a look and see exactly what happened here. Oh, sorry, that was me screwing up. So they collapse onto each other like this, and you can see that they're collapsing through each other. Now, the reason for that is because of the nature of colliders. So what we want to do is we want to make it so that doesn't happen. Uh, and there are a lot of ways to make that so that it doesn't happen. But the first and foremost important detail is we're going to want to make all of the mesh colliders convex. Convex mesh colliders avoid about 90% of the problems that mesh colliders have. So now we'll hit play and you can see that we're still collapsing, but nope, we caught. And that's because the convex colliders understand how to, conv how to collide with other convex colliders and we're kind of playing teeter-totter here. So what we have is this brick here is actually bumping up against its uh, against the brick above it because of the convex colliders. The convex colliders have made it so that this arch isn't as uh, nice as it might otherwise be. So what happens if we change it so that these two bricks alone do not have convex colliders? Perfect. As long as half of the bricks have convex colliders, it should all work fine. And that's a dirty little secret about Unity. Convex colliders are much, much better, um, but you can't always use them. So if you can, and you're having trouble with your colliders, um, make half of them convex. Make it so that one of the two colliders is, is convex. With that said, we now can do a little bit more work. Let's create a script. We're going to call this the chunky, try that again, chunky brickwork. Oh, come on, brickwork spawn. I'll just drop that on the water sluice here. Come on. And then open it up. Basically, here in Start, we're going to go and find all of our bricks. So, 
we're going to go transform dot uh, transform uh, children. Well, we don't have to do that. So we've already got it. For int a equals zero, a is less than transform dot lowercase t transform. Not sure why you don't have a lowercase t transform dot children count a plus plus, and then we'll just change the exact rotation and position of each of the uh, and scale of each of the bricks just a touch. So we say transform a dot local scale transform a dot yeah. So this is as I said, this is buggy. There's something wrong. Try that again. Transform dot get child a dot oh that's just me being stupid uh, local scale and then we can set the local scale to anything we would like what we would like to do is scale it slightly uh, on every axis just a touch so we can say equals new vector 3 and then what we want to do is mathf dot oh, sorry random dot range uh, and we can give it a minimum and a maximum in floats so we go range and then our minimum we can specify it in ints as well we definitely want to do it in floats instead so let's give it a float of 0.9f uh, 1.1f and then repeat that twice more and then we want to rotate it a little bit so transform.getchild a dot rotate and then here we can specify that we want to rotate around our vector 3 dot up in local space self uh, and we have to specify how much I forgot about that part um, so we want to just be a random dot range negative 15 to 15 so let's go ahead and see how that fares you can see that what we've done is uh, screwed up because the rotations are in local space and these do not have the same local space as we would expect up is in fact uh, not the same direction because all of these meshes are rotated by 90 degrees due to the difference in um, uh, due to the difference in the blender and and unity y-axis one of them is x y z and the other one is x z y so instead we have to make sure to make that in world space which means that we're always going to have to do this uh, with the assumption that the brickwork is going to be vertically stacked which is frankly not not such a bad call so here you can see is more like what we would like to to see happen and if we hit play it settles into something resembling a proper oh sorry try that again so here you can see it settled into something that is uh, awkward but would be reasonable to see um, if we unpause the memory so if we look at this um, it doesn't look like our scaling is significant enough we need to do a lot more scaling along this axis which is not the correct axis this is the y-axis even though it's actually the z-axis or vice versa I can never remember which so we're going to go ahead and change the scaling limits and try it one more time the other thing we're going to do is we're going to take this brick and we're going to move it that way it won't accidentally slip underneath anything so rather than 0 0.9 1.1 1 .1, let's do 0 0.8 and 1.2 0 0.8 and 1.2 point 0.6 and 1.4 how you doing up there alright so we have a broken set of uh, uh, of brickwork so we can sit here and we can polish this as much as we would like in order to get it to be exactly what we want it to be but for now let's go ahead and assume that this is fine uh, in actuality we're rotating too much so what we want to do let's go ahead and make one more tweak when we do this rotation we actually want to say if uh, random dot value is less than 0.2f we want to rotate it by a large amount and otherwise we only want to rotate it by a small amount 
All right, so now let's hit play. Wait for it to settle a little bit. I can see the shadows bouncing. <laughs> and here we can see that we've got a collapsed version. So let's go ahead and start over, just because I don't want our first one to be collapsed. And we can actually see how this looks. Looks decent. We may have to change the exact size and shape of this capstone, or perhaps just reduce its mass, uh, or increase everything else's mass. All right, let's do that. So here we can see our rigid body mass is 1. Let's go ahead and change them to 100. And that means that they won't shift nearly as much when that capstone falls on them. Ooh, we got some, something explosive happened there. You know, that's fine. That is just fine. So, with that in mind, we can drag that down into our prefabs. Let's go ahead and go into the ruins prefabs and drop this water sluice in. And when we drag that back out, you can see that it's all chunky. So, like this. And we can move that down into the ground the proper amount, and we can hit play. But, of course, as I mentioned, we actually want to, to delete all of these uh, in here. And that's actually something that I would like to not have to do automatically. So let's make it so our script does it for us. So here we have our chunky brickwork script, right? And we go in here and we say... Go through all of our children. Actually, this is actually what I was going to do originally. So rigid body, all of our rigid bodies. Get components in children. Rigid bodies. So we're collecting all of the physics rigid bodies. Okay? And then you say we bool ready uh, equals true. And we do for each RBS, uh, sorry, rigid body RB in RBS. And we say if RB dot at rest, no, sleeping, sleeping. If RB dot is sleeping, uh, then we're fine. If it's not sleeping, we say ready equals false and break. So we're looking through all of our rigid bodies and all of our children and we're making sure everyone's asleep. And if everyone is asleep, we're going to say uh, debug, oh wait, if not ready, return. And then we say debug.log uh, chunky brickwork spawn complete self-destructing. Don't forget to save us as a prefab. Okay. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go through all of the children and we're going to edit them all to remove their rigid bodies. No, oh, um, transform dot get child a dot uh, rigid body dot uh, destroy. There we are. Destroy the rigid body and then destroy this. Now, please note, destroying this will destroy the chunky brickwork spawn script, not the object itself. So let's take a look at this. We're going over to the console here. Uh, cannot be applied to not. Um, is this a function? It is, okay. So we'll hit play. Let's go ahead and pause it just so we can get a look at it here. And it takes a while to stop wobbling. We can probably fix that with some stickiness. Uh, it looks like it's not going to stop, so let's try again. Uh, we might as well change the rigid body to have a lot of drag. How about one and one? There we go. We just destructed it. So this is our first, our very first model. And if we look through, none of these have rigid bodies anymore, which means that they won't shift anymore. And there's no more of that, uh, that thing that will that does all the calculations and uh, and all that stuff. So this is now a stable prefab, and we can just drop it in here. Let's delete the old water sluice one because that had a whole bunch of stuff attached to it. Drop in the new one, 
And now, when we drop this new water sluice into our game, like so, move it down, oh, come on, like so, and we hit play, this is a perfectly stable sluice. Uh, the problem with it is that it is pretty expensive. There are a lot of bricks here, and all of the bricks have the same UV coordinates. Uh, so, how I need to spend 16 minutes. Let's go ahead and spend a little bit more time changing how we do some of our work here. First, we're going to make it so that all of the UV coordinates get offset. And that only works because we don't have anything specific here. We don't have any decals or anything. So it's okay if our UV coordinates are kind of arbitrary. Uh, so we're going to just, uh, here in Start, we're going through all of the children and changing their location. We're actually going to want to be a little bit more efficient here. Transform child equals transform dot get child A. I have no idea why it's not, it's refusing to let me type transform, whatever. And then here we'll say child dot local scale, child dot rotate, dot rotate. And here we can say uh, mesh filter mf equals child dot get component in children. Oh, get component mesh filter. We say mesh m equals mf dot. So here is the key to mesh filters. There are two pieces to this puzzle. One of them is the shared mesh, and one of them is the mesh. These are two different things. If we do the shared mesh, we'll be modifying every instance of the mesh, and that actually modifies it in the project. So that's a permanent modification to all of the meshes in this case. Uh, so it would share everything. So instead we want to do it with mesh, which is the instantiated mesh that is this guy alone. Um, and this will in fact duplicate the mesh and create an extra mesh in our memory, and we're gonna have to be careful about cleaning that up, and I'll show you about that later. But for now it should work fine. All we're going to do is we're going to go through each of the verts uh, and change it a little bit. So for int a equals zero, a is less than m dot uh, triangles, but we can't modify it while it's inside that object. So we're going to need not triangles either. Sorry, I'm talking faster than I'm thinking. Uh, we want the UV coordinates. So if we look at the mesh's UV coordinates, it's a vector two. We can't modify it while it's attached to the object. So we're going to have to create our own vector two UV. And then we're going to set it equal to uh, mesh.uvs. Name this mesh. And that is .uv, right? Yeah. And then at the end, we'll say mesh.uv equals uv. And in between the two, for int a equals 0, a is less than, oh, we can't use a, b equals 0, b is less than uv.length, b plus plus. And we're going to want to say uvb plus equals, and we're going to want to offset all of our UV values by some small amount. How much? Well, let's say vector2 offset equals random dot inside unit circle. How's that? We're going to want to divide that, though, because 1 is an entire image. So let's divide it by 10. Uh, and we're also going to want to make sure that we don't go off the edge. So vector2 new uv equals uv b plus offset. If new uv dot x is less than zero, new uv dot x equals zero. If new uv dot x is greater than one, new uv dot x equals one. If new uv dot y is less than zero, and I think you get the idea. There we are. So that should offset it by some random amount. Shall we see how that looks? Let's go into our console here, and we'll hit play. Let's pause it and just uh, watch it unfold here. All right, so if we look at these bricks, you can see that they are slightly different, but they're not hugely different. They're only a little bit different. Well, can we make them a lot different? Well, sure. We do have to worry about smushing the UV maps up against the edge of the map, but there are two ways to avoid that. One is that we can flip them, and one is uh, that we can rotate them. Rotating is a little bit obnoxious, uh, but let's go ahead and take a look and see what we want to do. So, 
bool flip x equals random dot. Can we get a bool here? Uh, no, I guess we just have to do a value less than. Oh, that was not what I wanted to do at all. Bool flip y and bool rotate equals. So now we say if flip x, then new uv dot x equals 1 minus new uv dot x. If flip y, then new uv dot y equals 1 minus new uv dot y. If rotate, then we will exchange um, new uv dot x equals new uv dot y and new uv dot y equals new u equals r. There we are. So that ought to make it so that we have uh, quite a bit of a different set of objects. Now keep in mind, I'm not doing this calculation for every single uh, vert. I'm not saying that every single UV has to be flipped and swapped separately. All of the UVs are moved the same amount. All of them are flipped or not flipped. All of them are rotated or not rotated within any given brick. And that means that we'll end up with no compression errors or anything screwy like that. It'll look right. Um, and so that is what it ends up looking like in this case. So this is our new set of bricks. And it's not a bad set of bricks, really. Let's go ahead and delete our old one here, put this in. And let's see what this looks like when we put it into the game world. Ah, you can see what just happened is all of the verts, all of the meshes went away. Now, I said that we were going to have trouble with these meshes, and this is one of the things I was talking about. Uh, all of these have uh, their instantiated meshes go away. So th that, that dot mesh is a runtime only thing. And instead, it's reverted back to being null. Uh, now, it, it stored the fact that there was a runtime mesh. So it didn't revert back to uh, the old shared mesh. But it didn't store the fact that that runtime mesh had certain parameters and certain values. So the runtime mesh is now null. Fantastic. So how do we fix that? Uh, basically, we have a couple of options. One of the options is to actually save these meshes as uh, uh, as individual objects. The other is to say, well, screw it. What we'll do is we'll just have the UVs randomized every time you start the game. Who's going to notice, right? Uh, another option is that we can com combine all of the meshes into a single mesh, and then we'd have to save that anyway. So let's go ahead and work on that. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new mesh. We're going to call it Mesh Combo. And we're going to create it just new, new mesh. And then we say combo dot combine meshes. And you can see that this takes an argument that's a little bit unusual, a combine instance array. Well, what the heck is a combine instance? Combine instance. CI equals new combine instance. Um, OK. What is it? Oh, look at this. Mesh transform. Hmm. Hmm. Seems pretty straightforward, don't you think? All right. So combine instance array uh, combiners equals new combine instance array with the same number of children as our child count. And then we go through all of our children. Um, actually, let's go ahead and do this a little bit better here. We'll do mesh filter array mesh filters equals get components in children mesh filter that way we have it all pre-sorted and then we can say mesh filters dot length and the reason that this is a little bit better is because we can just go through each of the mesh filters and we don't have to keep searching over and over and over ci.mesh equals mesh filters a dot, and then of course we want the mesh. Now up here we are setting the shared mesh, we no longer want to do that. It can actually screw us up if we're not careful. So we set up the mesh, do we want to set up the transform as well? Sure. 
Obviously, it's all offset and stuff. And then we want to add it. Right? And then we can say combo equals, and then uh, combo dot um, uh, combine meshes, and we pass it this list. What sort of other arguments? Merge submeshes, use matrices. So I don't think we need those, but let's go ahead and try it out. Uh, what we're going to do here is we are going to have our mesh be a public variable. And then down here, we're going to say combined mesh equals combo. And then instead of just deleting these children here, what we're going to do is we're going to actually uh, delete our entire um, uh, roster of kids. So we're going to just destroy all of our children here, which sounds gruesome. So destroy, transform to get child, game object. All right. Cannot convert transform to matrix. Oh yes, of course, because this is actually not a transform transform. Uh, so local to world matrix. I think that this is the direction we want to go. I actually can never remember. All right, so let's go up here, hit play. Oh, see we slipped through a little bit again, that's fine. Grum, grum, grum. All right, so pause it. And we've just destroyed all of our sub meshes, but we have, oh, we destroyed ourselves. sorry. Um, we have to not destroy ourselves so we can look at the mesh that we created uh, until we save it. So I'll try that again. All right, so pause it. Oh, uh, that's interesting. So we actually have, well, when we don't destroy this, it, sorry, you have to say, uh, if combined mesh does not equal null, return. Because we're right now we're overriding our combined mesh with a new empty mesh every single frame. So we want to say, well, if we already calculated the combined mesh stop, this normally isn't an issue because I destroy the object. I destroy this, this script. But um, it is an issue in this particular case. So you can see that our object vanished, and that's what we kind of expected. But if we look at this combined mesh, it doesn't look like anything. So the question is, did that work or did it not work? I think that the easiest way to tell is to print out some statistics on that. Shall we take a look? Yep, it worked. At least it worked somewhat. Um, we might have the verts backwards or something. But uh, this mesh actually exists as a mesh. This is a mesh that we can, in theory, add to the game world. But how do we save it? Can we just drag it? No, of course not. That would be too easy. <sighs> so what you would need to do is you actually need to save it using the asset database system. Exciting work. So we go back in here. Um, I'm a little bit fuzzy on this actually because I very rarely need to use it. Yeah, there it is. So we have a lot of options here in the asset database, but this is the one that we're going to be using. Uh, we have to keep a clear eye on what we need to do because even if we create it, we're not actually done until we have saved it. Uh, so once we create it, we then need to save it. Got it? Straightforward enough. Let's start with the save assets so we don't forget. So now we are creating an asset. We're going to go ahead and create that combined mesh asset and we're going to save it somewhere. How about we save it into the directory uh, 
combo meshes combo mesh dot asset uh, but we have a combo mesh and you can see that it has the right shape you can see in the thumbnail here it's got the shape of the arch there are a couple of small little details that we need to take care of before we are ready to uh, um, to call that a mesh so uh, combo dot recalculate bounds and combo dot recalculate normals wait for it to save and there's our combo mesh let's drag it out into the game world and see what it says for itself oh it's still invisible what the heck Ah, perfect. So I don't know exactly what was wrong with that. Maybe it was the way I was dragging it into the scene and it was actually underground somewhere. But it does work fine, as you can see. So if we were to put this combo mesh into the scene down here... Nope. Oh, it vanished. So right now what we can see that one of the issues we're, we're having is that the combo mesh is offset. That was the issue. It's going from local to world, and of course, world was uh, offset by that amount. So the center of this is actually not where we think it is. Uh, if we look at the pivot point, it is um, where the hell is it? Way down here. So uh, we have a mesh that is in some weird position, which explains our issues. Uh, but if we were to adjust this mesh manually, instead of using pivot we could use center so there are definitely ways to fix this and uh, we will probably have to use them so if we drop the right material on I said dirt this time we can actually go into this combo mesh delete the other one it's in the wrong spot somewhere we can add in a mesh collider. Now we can't make this one um, convex because if we do it just turns into a wrapped up little bundle. So uh, it exploded. Why did it explode? Ah, it exploded because it's named the same thing as the other as this thing creates. So we're gonna have to rename that mesh. Go into combo meshes and name this mesh one. That's better. And you can see that it's just as solid as any other mesh. So the question is whether or not this is a good way to create these meshes. Uh, and, you know, I can't tell you that for sure. Um, there are a lot of ways to do this. And the way I'm doing it actually just writes a mesh out. Uh, and I have done this before a lot, but I'm not at all sure that it is the best way. Uh, one of the things we can do that I'm not doing at the moment is uh, we can add our meshes into a set of prefabs but I'm not doing that I don't really feel like doing that um, so this is what we are going to use at least for the foreseeable future for creating this kind of, of combobulated mess the only issue remaining is that this is offset by some gargantuanly stupid amount uh, and there are several ways to fix that one of the ways to fix that is to uh, subtract the proper amount but the easiest way to fix it is of course to put this at zero 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 that way it isn't offset and that means that this guy here we're gonna wanna put him at zero uh, negative point oh nine so that'll override the combo mesh then we stop delete this mesh, we don't need it anymore, and that'll actually get rid of the combo mesh object. And then we can drop the new combo mesh object into the game world. Hmm? It dropped through the terrain for some reason, but it is in the right spot. If we uh, select the pivot, you can see the pivot is right at the bottom where it's supposed to be. And uh, we can simply add in a mesh collider and also add in a material like boot <laughs> and there we are oh that's going to overwrite so we don't want it to overwrite let's change the name of it before it overwrites uh, combo meshes 
arch one. Boom. So these are still very sharp edged and stuff, but that's a materials issue. We'll deal with that later. I wanted to go ahead and show you how to do this, uh, or how I do it, uh, just so that you would get an impression of some of the more complicated and unnecessarily convoluted ways that I can create content. Um, now, if you don't need to create content anywhere near this uh, annoyingly complicated and, vari and variable, then you can uh, actually ignore everything I've done. But there is one important thing, one incredibly important thing we will be using this technique for later. We're going to be creating monsters in this with this technique. So doing it with arches is a great way to get used to how it works. And that way, when we do it with monsters, you won't get so confused. Uh, plus, combined meshes is a really good utility to know how to use. And now you know some of the ins and outs, because I, uh, I just messed it up by putting it at 110 above zero and not thinking that that was going to screw it up. Uh, so, all told, you hopefully have learned a fair amount from our uh, little uh, um, adventure and will happily create your own meshes from now on. Uh, where are you? Oh, you're down here, of course. Because you're supposed to be at 110. I'm so not used to working at 110. Here's another arch. Let's go ahead and put it next to the first one. Let's drop dirt onto both of these arches. This has to have a mesh collider added to it. Clunk. Oh, and of course we need to rename it, as always. We could actually do something more clever with the naming. We can check and see whether an asset exists uh, and then increment it. We can keep track of how many assets we've created and increment it. But you know what? This will work. So here we've got two arches, and you can see that going through them is a tight they're not arches that feel spacious. They're arches that feel like there might be something lurking on the other side. And that is kind of what we're aiming for. And you can see that we're starting to get a feel for our uh, system. It looks like a ruins. We're starting to create ruins, even though this is just very basic stuff. Oh, uh, let's go ahead and not put that in. We'll just duplicate this instead. Move it over. Um, local please move it over uh, duplicate it instead and move it over something like that uh, and then we will drop in our new mesh here and move it up oh that was all doing play mode wasn't it because I am a frigging idiot <sighs> try again So, how do you think that our uh, ruins are starting to look? Do you think these look properly ruinous? Do you think that'd feel good as you were wandering around to see this kind of rubble? Well, let me know in the comments what you think. And uh, I actually have to edit this particular video because it's made out of two videos due to an error in the codec uh, and in the recording. Uh, so maybe it will be less long than the hour of footage I actually recorded. <laughs>